Yeah, okay, so for um, some quick housekeeping rules, we'll be pausing throughout uh, the webinar for, for questions and we'll also have Q&A at the end. So if you have any questions, um, feel free to drop them in the Q&A box, not the chat box, um, and Rana will be moderating the Q&A box throughout the webinar. All right, well, let's get started then. So the, so we're gonna start out by talking about why it's important to compost, then we'll move on to what composting is. We'll talk a bit about com different compost systems that you can use. And then we'll talk a little bit about recipes and ratios, what goes in and what stays out. And we'll wrap up with upkeep and animals. All right, so why compost in the first place? Why is it important? Uh, so for starters, your food scraps are pretty smelly and they're also pretty heavy. And in Vermont, 20% uh, of our food scraps are, are, are trash are actually just food scraps. So diverting that away from the landfill uh, to composting can make a pretty big difference. And composting is a great way um, to also help your soil uh, it can also help fertilize your garden. And uh, if you're gardening this year, it's great to add compost to whatever you're growing. Um, and even if you don't compost at home and instead you use like a local hauling service, composting as a business actually creates more jobs than landfilling does. So it's great for the local economy too. Um, another great reason to compost is because when food scraps are landfilled, um, as you'll see in this next photo, uh, they don't really biodegrade properly because um, the landfills are so compact that they're basically anaerobic, which also causes the bacteria to produce methane gas, which is a greenhouse gas that's up to 30 times as powerful as carbon dioxide. So when you're diverting your food scraps away from the landfill, you're also helping to combat climate change, which is pretty awesome. If there are any other reasons that you compost or are interested in composting, feel free to share it in the chat box too. We would love to know. Um, so another great reason to compost is that there's the universal recycling law. Uh, you might be familiar with it as Act 148. So in short, the law requires that everyone in Vermont has to keep food scraps out of the trash and landfill. Um, and it went into effect on July 1st, so basically at the beginning of this month. Um, also, I realized that uh, not everyone may, on this webinar today may be living in Vermont, so I just want to emphasize that this law is just for Vermonters. And if you have similar laws where you live, feel free to also share that in the chat box. Um, so this law has actually been gradually phasing in for the past six years, and all businesses in Vermont have been required to divert food scraps since 2017. Uh, but now it applies to everybody. Um, also, one important thing to note is that uh, meat and bones are exempt for residents, so those can go in the trash instead of your compost bin at home. Um, however, there are other more sustainable ways to manage your meat and bones, and we'll go into that in much more detail later in this presentation. And while today we are focused on backyard composting, uh, we also want to acknowledge that there are a variety of different ways that you can manage your food scraps and composting may not be the most uh, suitable one for you. Uh, for example, uh, you could use local drop-off and pickup services. And one advantage to that is that they do take meat and bones. Um, another example is that if you're lucky enough to have a neighbor who composts um, and they want to get more scraps, you can um, ask them if they'll take yours. Uh, and other options are there are transfer stations, uh, there are community composting sites, and um, if you're interested, we have a whole list of drop-off sites and pickup services in the Central Vermont District, and it's all on our website, so um, be sure to check that out if that might be more suitable and convenient for you. And this photo is actually a drop-off site by the Vermont Compost Company. It's in Montpelier, it's right off Main Street. It's a little bit outside of town, but it's really easy to get to. And um, that's where I dropped off my food scraps.
Awesome. Thanks, Dora. So what is compost? When we talk about compost, we are talking about finished compost. That is the, the materials that we have put into the compost, the food scraps and any other inputs have been broken down and decomposed into this rich material that is almost completely decayed and is a great organic fertilizer or, um, or land and soil builder. It's a combination, as I said, of those inputs, those nitrogen inputs, your greens, your food scraps, and your carbon inputs, which we call browns. Those are things like wood shavings, um, other high carbon inputs, and we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later and, and give you all kinds of examples of, of what's what. And the other thing to remember is that compost, um, the compost that you're putting on your garden, for example, is a value added product. It takes a lot of um, a lot of time and effort to, for example, collect all the food scraps from residents and businesses, and then to process it and grind it and mix it up with the other inputs. Then they sort it, they, they screen it and take any contaminants out, then they package it. And eventually you see it at the hardware store in a bag that you can buy. And, um, and there's that that great fertilizer that you know as compost that you can use to improve your soil and your garden. <clears throat> the most important thing about compost is that it's alive. It is full of bugs and microbes and fungi and bacteria. And those organisms, those microorganisms are essential for the process of composting. They are the ones that do all the work of breaking that food and those materials down into, into usable um, nutrient rich compounds and, and compost. And it's, it's important to keep them alive and happy. And the, the best thing that we can do if we're trying to compost is help create an environment where they can thrive. Um, and those organisms, they use oxygen to break these materials down which is why, as Dora said, if you have food scraps in the landfill, in an anaerobic environment, all crushed and capped, um, your food scraps won't be composting as they should be. So looking a little closer, you'll see that these are some drawings of some of the, the microorganisms that you find in compost and in soil. One teaspoon of soil contains between 100 million and 1 billion or microorganisms. And com with compost, it's even higher. It's because it's all that food, all those nutrients that, that they are working hard to break down and decompose. And um, that's great. You want all this, this microorganism life, all these tiny little creatures and bacteria and fungi breaking down your, your, your food and your other inputs to turn it into compost. So when it comes to feeding your compost, uh, you wanna follow this um, simple recipe. So um, just like all living things, um, a compost pile needs food, air, and water. Um, just so think about like, what do you feed your pets and what do you need yourself for survival? And here is a, um, a general recipe that we would recommend. So, for every three parts of uh, carbon-rich materials, you want one part of nitrogen-rich materials. Um, so the nitrogen-rich materials, we also call greens. Um, a good example of that is like your food scraps. And the carbon-rich materials, we also call browns, which is, um, you can think of like wood shavings, for example. So in this um, photo, you could think of, um, say like two to three buckets of wood shavings for like one bucket of food scraps. 
And um, this is a concept we'll dive much deeper um, into later in this presentation, but we just want to quickly introduce the idea of uh, feeding your compost, this like balanced diet of uh, one part greens to three parts browns. Um, but again, we'll revisit this later and um, go into examples. Great. Thanks for that, Dora. Brenna, do we have any questions that have come in recently? Hi, yes, we have one question so far. Um, and this one is, um, should we avoid putting garden waste in the compost like squash plants, et cetera, if it has powdery mildew or squash beetles? Okay. <clears throat> so, um, it depends on on how your your compost is working. Um, if it's working properly, well, the beetles won't they won't matter. Um, they if you're trying to get rid of beetles, uh, one thing you can do is is mix up some soap and some water and some chili powder and spray it on your leaves. That'll help with beetles. Um, for powdery mildew, I believe that that will just break down in the compost. Um, I'm not I'm not that well versed on powdery mildew, but um, but generally speaking, you want to keep weeds out of your compost because sometimes they can, especially if they've gone to seed, sometimes they can make it through the composting process and then end up introducing those those weed seeds into wherever you put your compost when it's finished. Great, I have a couple more questions. Okay. Um, how about if we don't have access to wood shavings, is there anything else that they could use? Dora, do you want to answer this one? Sure. So yeah, there are so many different kinds of browns. Um, and if you don't have access to wood shavings, there are many other options. And we'll cover that later in this presentation. We'll give you um, a lot of different examples that you can uh, use as browns instead of wood shavings. And I'd like to add to that, that you may actually be able to get wood shavings um, and we'll talk about where when we talk about materials. <clears throat> Great. Um, let's do one more. And I believe the rest of these are going to be answered in the presentation. So um, Maria wants to know, uh, I take my neighbor's compost, let it sit in a bucket for a week, then <laughs> then it's full of maggots. Is that safe to dump into my soil saver composter? Dora, do you want to take this one? Sure. Um, yeah, so that happens when food's decomposing, all the, sometimes maggots will grow, but um, that's totally fine. It's all part of the decomposition process. Um, and yeah, it'll be totally fine um, in your soil saver. Great. I might also add that um, if you are having a lot of maggots, for example, uh, you could try dumping the compost uh, or the food scraps more often so that they don't build up as much. If you did it a couple times a week, for example. Okay, great. Well, Let's talk about <clears throat> different compost systems that people use now, and I'm gonna take us through a whole range of options. So <clears throat> when you're selecting your compost system, um, first thing is to think about what you're trying to achieve um, and what your parameters are. Do you have a backyard? Do you have, um, just an apartment? Do you have um, many acres of land? Um, so think about your space, think about your goals, your time, your energy. How much time can you commit to this? Um, again, we're thinking of it as a pet. It does need some maintenance and it needs to be fed those different inputs. It needs to be watered and it needs to be stirred so that it is aerated and, and has enough oxygen. Um, for your little microorganisms who are doing the work of breaking down your, your food scraps. Um, so each of these compost systems has different requirements and 
uh, different processes. It's all basically the same, but um, some require more attention than others. <clears throat> so um, somebody just brought up the soil saver. And this is one that, that we sell at the district. It's, it's very simple and um, it packs flat, so it's easy to get, it's easy to set up. It just bolts together. Um, it also is enclosed, which is a good, a good way to do it. This keeps um, rodents and, um, and other animals out of the bin and keeps them from digging around and, and looking for things they might wanna eat. We also recommend getting a piece of hardware cloth, which you can get at any um, garden and, and yard and hardware store. It's hardware cloth is a wire mesh and it comes in different sizes. Um, it's a wire mesh that you can get in court with quarter inch holes in it or half inch holes. Quarter inch will keep almost anything out, including mice and rats and things like that. Um, it doesn't necessarily work against bears, but, um, but if you line the bottom of that, um, that compost bin with the hardware cloth, it'll keep pretty much anything from burrowing under that, but it'll still allow access to the dirt so those microorganisms can pass freely through it and do their work. It's also tidy, obviously it's, it's a nice compact um, cube and it's about three feet by three feet um, so it's a nice um, option if you have a little bit of space, but not a lot. And, um, and it's, it's about right for a, a single family home. Um, if you are going to be using these for a long time, they will eventually fill up. And we recommend getting a couple of them so that um, while one is curing and you're letting that compost finish, you can start adding your, your fresh food scraps to the next one. The open pile system. This is, um, this is a passive system. So it's gonna be sort of a cold composting system. It's not gonna heat up much. Um, and so because of that, it, it works kind of slowly. It's, it's discouraged by the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department, especially if you're using food scraps. If you are just composting yard waste, like grass clippings or dead leaves or maybe uh, flower stalks and things like that, it's fine to do. But um, if you're putting food scraps in, it will probably attract animals like raccoons and squirrels and, and maybe mice and um, potentially also pets, which can be dangerous because some of the, some of the food scraps that you put in there um, can develop certain types of molds that are that are toxic for dogs. Uh, there was a dog back in back here in Montpelier that died because they got into a, an open compost pile or something like that. Um, so generally speaking, we don't recommend this method. Um, it is low input and it will, the materials will break down, but generally uh, you only want to use this for non-food items. Um, these are some homemade bins that we have seen around. Um, some of these we designed and we have plans for these up on our website. You, you're more than welcome to download and, and build these in your backyard. Um, <clears throat> these, are, these are two and three bin systems and they do require some, uh, some building skill. So, um, so factor that in, you know, if you can if you can cut and, and nail and screw things together um, and you feel like a project, this is a great way to do it. Um, these are lined with hardware cloth to keep those small animals out. <clears throat> and it also keeps everything together so that it can interact and, and break down quicker. Um, you notice that some of these have lids and some don't, but, um, but you can see that the multiple bins offer an opportunity to have one section that has compost that is almost done and curing and then the other one you can add your fresh food scraps to like i mentioned with having two soil savers for example so if you, you can see in this picture there's the hardware cloth behind the behind the digging fork there that'll keep the small animals out <clears throat> and then in this system um, you have three bins now this is this is a pretty serious system. This might be for multiple families. Um, 
unless you're producing a lot of food waste, um, this might be too much for a single family home. Um, but again, I guess it depends on, on how big your family is. Um, so a two, two bin system is, is pretty ideal for most single family homes. That's, um, that's what we recommend. And, um, and we do have these plans up on our website, so you can check those out and build it yourself if you're feeling like a good project. So the next system I want to talk about is a tumbler system. So you can make these yourself or you can buy them. Um, these are off the ground and, um, and they're enclosed. So animals won't be able to access them, uh, which is good. You, you want to keep your, um, your food scraps and your, your composting materials uh, away from animals. Um, they, the, uh, the homemade ones, um, they're sometimes hard to work and hard to spin uh, unless you're, you've got a great design for it. And there are a lot of designs out there that you could check out. Um, it's best used with a, a bin so that when you are, when you're, when it's full, you can empty it out and then put it in a compost bin to finish the process of breaking down. But it does, it's, it's really good for a small space where you don't have a lot of land um, and it'll work faster than, um, than a, a compost bin like a soil saver because it's all together and it heats up. Um, and because of the, the rotational process of it, it'll make the materials interact more and it'll mix them up, which, which helps aerate them as long as you remember to turn it all the time. <laughs> Um, the Jora, which you see on the bottom of the screen here, um, is a, a, f a much fancier version that you can purchase. It has two chambers and it's insulated and it works really well and really quickly for breaking down stuff. So we have some of these at some community compost sites um, in our member towns and, um, and they're, they're very cool, uh, but they are pricey. And they do need wood shavings or wood pellets to add to them. That helps um, again to, well, we'll talk more about the whole process and the recipe, but that helps to, um, to absorb some of the liquids that would otherwise collect. And it also provides the carbon input to, to balance out your food scraps as nitrogen. Then the last system that we're going to talk about today is the green cone. This is a very cool, little system and it's half buried underground. It has a, a basket, a round basket, sort of like a laundry basket that you bury um, about two feet deep. And then there's this plastic green cone. There are actually two cones that fit together on top of it and they have a nice lid and it keeps animals out. It's not actually a compost system, it's a solar digester. So what happens there is it heats up and um, through the, the holes in that basket on the bottom, bugs and worms and microbes can access all of the food scraps that you put in there. And the cool thing about these is that you can, you, you can do food scraps, but you can also do meat and bones. And I've been using one of these at home for, for meat scraps and fat and bones um, for the past year and a half now, and it's worked very well. Um, and I've been able to keep those things out of my compost bin where they might otherwise attract animals. Um, things to remember about this is that um, it needs at least a half a day of sun and it's, um, it's passive, so it's very low input. You basically just put the, the materials in there and let them, let them rot and they um, are eaten by those microorganisms and any nutrients in those uh, those food scraps then leach out through the soil um, and fertilize things that you've planted around them. Um, so it's a, di it's a different system, but it's very neat and it's, it's really good for small spaces. The other th the important thing about this is that you do have well-drained soil. Uh, if it's something like clay or really dense soil, um, it won't work properly. It, it, does, it does need some drainage. So um, if you have uh, different spaces to choose from. Try to choose a spot with good drainage, with good sun, and um, 
you may need to modify the area around it by adding some sand or some gravel so that it can drain. All right, so then the other thing that's nice to have if you're composting is to, um, another bin right next to your compost bin for your brown inputs. So this is, remember your browns are your carbon rich materials and you wanna add three times as many carbon input materials as nitrogen input materials. So that's three scoops of, of wood shavings um, or something else uh, to balance out each scoop of food scraps that you add. And if you have it right there next to it, it's really simple, it's really nice, and um, you won't forget it. Okay, so I'm sure we have a lot of questions now about these compost systems. Brenna and um, Dora, do you wanna jump on and we can answer some of these live? Absolutely, we have some questions. All right. Um, all right, so the first few um, have to do with soil savers. Um, somebody wants to know how, whether they have to turn the compost in their soil saver. And another one wants to know whether um, if they already installed it, if it's too late to install hardware cloth. Mm, okay. Well, I can, I can answer one and then you take the next one, Dora. Um, <clears throat> so I'll talk about turning. Um, and I do want to mention that we are going to talk more about aeration and turning later, but, um, but short answer is yes, it should be turned and aerated. Um, all of your compost and whatever system you're using, with the exception of the green cone, uh, should be turned and aerated pretty regularly. Um, if, uh, if you haven't been doing it, it's okay, um, but you should probably start. And there are a few reasons to do that. Um, primarily, it's because those, you wanna make the best environment for those microorganisms as you can, and they need air. So if you stir it, um, you'll make air pockets and then they'll be able to breathe and thrive in there. <clears throat> awesome. Um, I have another question, a few questions about uh, water. Just a sec, Dora, do you wanna talk about the hardware cloth for the soil saver? Yeah, um, so if you've already installed your soil saver and you've added food scraps into it, um, adding the hardware cloth might be kind of inconvenient. You'd have to like find a way to um, basically take out all the materials inside and then uh, install the hardware cloth and then like set it up back again. Um, I was actually wondering, Theron, if you had any tips about how to, how to do that. Sure, so um, if, yeah, Dora's right. If, if you already have a bunch of materials in the bin, it's gonna be difficult. Um, one thing that you could do is just lay that hardware cloth down about the size of the footprint of that soil saver then lift the soil saver off of your materials, set it down on top of the hardware cloth, and then you can just shovel um, any materials that, are, that were in the bin uh, back into the bin. And that would work just fine. Um, you know, try to keep it simple, but <clears throat> I mean, yeah, that's the best thing I, I can think of. Great. Um, so another few questions have to do with how much water is needed in your compost system and should you keep it open to the environment or close it off? Good question. <clears throat> do you want to take this one, Dora, or shall I? I can take it. Okay. Um, well, we'll talk a little bit more about this uh, later in the presentation. Um, a little test you can do to see if your compost bin has enough water in it. But you don't need to leave it open for rainwater or anything. But um, you do want to uh, make sure that it isn't too dry. Um, again, we'll talk a little bit more about um, how to tell, how to do a little test with the um, when you squeeze the materials inside. But um, if it doesn't end up being too dry, you could just add water into it. 
And if it's too wet, um, you can add more browns to it. Great. Um, we have a couple of questions about brown materials, but you are going to get to that in a bit, right? That's right. Yes, great. Um, and so the last question here um, is uh, about bears. If mm. um, this person's been dealing with bears, they live in Duxbury, how to keep those away. Okay, we are gonna talk about that later as well. Um, <clears throat> but I would say the most important thing is to keep smells down. And the best way to do that is to add lots of browns. Great, that should do it for now. Okay, great. Well, let's move on with the presentation then. And um, <clears throat> Dora, <clears throat> excuse me, Dora, do you wanna take it away with the recipes? Yeah, yeah, so now we're going to uh, dive into what you should or shouldn't feed your compost bin at home. Uh, so just to quickly review, there are two main kinds of ingredients for your compost, the greens and the browns. And um, as we kind of touched upon before, uh, you wanna keep in mind this recipe of like three parts browns to one parts greens. So browns are those really carbon rich materials. Uh, somebody had asked about what are some examples of browns. So um, in addition to wood shavings, there's also like dry leaves, uh, straw or hay, uh, even shredded newspaper. And uh, for greens, those are the nitrogen rich materials. Um, and those include things like your food scraps, uh, fresh grass clippings, fresh garden trimmings, uh, but no weeds, uh, certain kinds of manures. And um, also I should just mention that uh, those things like food scraps uh, do add moisture into the compost bin system too. So if you're wondering how, um, water or how uh, yeah, water gets into your compost bin. That, that's one way. Um, so the important thing here is that you stick to that ratio of about three parts browns to one parts greens. Um, that creates um, a balanced environment for your compost bin system. It helps keep the moisture levels um, more balanced. It helps keep odors down, pests down. And in general, it just keeps the microorganisms happy so your compost system um, can do its job. And one good tip to help your food scraps break down a little faster um, is to keep the ingredients smaller. So if you have banana peels, for example, you can cut those up into smaller pieces. Uh, if you have grass, um, garden trimmings, you can mow those. Uh, but you should expect that larger and tougher materials, for example, like avocado shells or avocado seeds, will be tougher to break down or will take longer to break down. So uh, when it comes to food scraps, uh, some examples of food scraps that can go in your bin are uh, vegetable and fruit scraps, loose leaf tea, uh, coffee grounds, um, basically anything that has ever been food um, except meat or bones. Um, also certain paper products too, like napkins, tissues, So uh, in your kitchen, there are many ways you can collect your fruit scraps. And personally, I collect my fruit scraps in like a one gallon pail that, that I keep on my kitchen countertop. Uh, in these photos, you can see there's like so many different kinds of containers, even like you can even reuse some plastic containers like the ones here um, to hold your food scraps. And if you plan on keeping a pail in your kitchen on your kitchen counter, uh, we would suggest like a one to two gallon bucket or pail. Um, and we'd also suggest dumping your food scraps every day or so. Um, and of course, the size of your pail will depend slightly on um, your household size and how much scraps you're actually generating um, on a regular basis. And sometimes people like to include liners, uh, like the one in that uh, the bottom right photo, you'll see like a green uh, bag like a bio bag or something um, to make collecting and dumping the scraps a little cleaner. Um, and 
In the top photo, you can see somebody made like a liner out of newspapers. So um, we get a lot of questions about whether things like those green compostable uh, bags are uh, okay to use in your backyard composts. And the Composting Association of Vermont recommends that as long as the bag is BPI certified, you'll see like a label on the box. If it's BPI certified, it's fine to use and dump in your own backyard compost. Um, but a newspaper liner, a homemade newspaper liner is also a great alternative. And if you go online or YouTube, you can find a lot of tutorials about how to um, fold up like a newspaper liner. So remember that you want three parts browns for uh, one parts greens. So if you're collecting a lot of scraps, that can mean um, you need a lot of browns. Um, and uh, browns, again, are like leaves, sawdust, um, shredded paper, paper towels. Um, and the kinds of papers you don't want to include are things like colored papers, um, glossy papers like uh, magazines, uh, color-coded cardboards like cereal boxes, but things like paper towels, um, uncoated paper plates, um, shredded newspaper or cardboard are fine. So we talked a lot about what goes in, but there are definitely some things that should stay out. So basically anything that was never a living plant or animal should definitely stay out of your compost bin. Um, you want to make sure you peel off those PLU stickers off of your vegetables and fruits and remove any like twist ties or rubber bands that might also be on your fruits and vegetables um, before you dump your scraps. And you also want to keep out florist flowers because they often contain things like fungicides, pesticides, herbicides, and those uh, substances can slow or even stop your compost. And uh, as we mentioned before, residents are exempt from putting meat and bones in their home compost bins. So those can go in your trash or a green cone like Theron talked about, or it can go in a drop off or pick up service instead. All right, great. <clears throat> Thanks, Dora. Um, Brenna, do we have any questions about what can go in and what can stay out? We do. <laughs> uh, <thought> we might. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I have had a few people ask whether you can add um, ash or burnt wood into your compost pile. Okay. Well, I can answer that one. So ash is a basic material that's the opposite of acidic and the bacteria that you want to live in your compost like it a little acidic so you should not add ash to your compost uh, some people will spread ash around in their gardens or um, or yards a little bit in the spring sort of as a substitute for lime but it shouldn't go in your compost Great. Um, how about, um, we've got a few here, breads and pastas, alliums like garlics and onions and citrus, um, or, and also fruits or vegetables that are not organic. All of that is fine to compost. Great. And then I have a couple questions about um, brown materials. Can, mm -hmm. I don't even know how to say this, so I might embarrass myself. I've only seen this word printed, but quar, right? The coconut husks. Oh. Can, um, can that be used as a brown material? Huh. Um, I'm not sure what that's made of, um, but generally if it's dried out plant material, it's considered a brown. So you know, green leaves or green grass clippings would be a green, but if they're brown and dried out, um, they become a brown. So um, I'd say yes. Great. And um, I have a couple questions about the three to one ratio. 
Yeah. Um, is this ratio a volume ratio or a weight ratio? Volume. Yep. And um, last question for now. Um, is there any um, compound or chemical that you can add to compost to accelerate it? Hmm. Well, um, so not really. The, the thing that you can do to make it go faster is chop your materials smaller, make sure you have that, that ratio of three carbon to one nitrogen, and, um, and generally uh, try to keep those, those microorganisms happy. Um, I want to come back to the carbon nitrogen ratio a little bit. The, in case you're interested, the carbon <clears throat> and the nitrogen, it's all food for those microorganisms. The carbon provides the energy. It's the, it's, it's the high energy material. And the nitrogen provides the building blocks for proteins that those microorganisms and bugs use to build their bodies. So um, that's the ratio that keeps all those organisms the happiest and provides them with all the nutrients they need to thrive. Um, and then aside from that, it's air and water. Great, that's it for now. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about upkeep then. Um, so, oh, here we go. <clears throat> so air, um, we mentioned turning the compost before. Um, <clears throat> I use a stick, you can use a digging fork, you can use a special um, compost turning tool. They make all kinds of implements for turning compost. Like, like I said though, I just use a stick and that's fine. Um, it works well, it's cheap. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the most important thing about this is you just want to mix everything up and you want to aerate it. You want to dig all the way down to the bottom and what it does is it, it speeds it up because it creates um, air pockets. <clears throat> it, it makes the, the carbon and the nitrogen materials interact more. It can also eliminate the odors and it allows th those organisms to access the, the different resources that they're looking for. Um, basically, if you, know, if you see some materials like maybe a pepper or a banana peel in your, in your bin that's not breaking down, just try to cover it up with, um, with more material and, um, and try to you know, mix it from the bottom to the top and do it whenever you have the energy to, whenever you feel like it um, and, and it'll work. You can, you can set yourself up a schedule if you wanna be more regimented about it. Um, <clears throat> but again, it depends on your goals. Um, if you notice it's taking too long to break down, Try stirring it. Um, if it doesn't bother you, that's okay too. Um, so that's that's a, a quick run through of turning and of aeration. Water. <clears throat> so um, how much water you add is going to depend on a lot of different factors. Um, one of those is how, how wet your, your nitrogen inputs, how wet your food scraps are when you're putting them in. <clears throat> um, it also depends on where your compost bin is located. If it's in a hot, sunny climate, um, if it's right out in the sun, it might dry out quicker and you might need to add more water to it. If you're in a, a very humid or, um, or wet landscape or, um, or if your compost bin is in the shade, it might not dry out as quickly and you might find that you never need to water it. Um, it, the, the water from the food scraps might be enough. <clears throat> An easy way to test this is to squeeze the finished compost and the finished compost should feel sort of like a, a wrung out sponge. Um, if you, if your compost isn't finished, just use your best judgment and, um, and, tr and it should be sort of moist. Um, think of it as, as, as um, like a good soil, um, you want it to be wet, but not sloppy wet. Um, and, uh, and you know, the sponge, 
the sponge analogy is, is really ideal. That's, that's, um, that's the right ratio of, of dryness. Um, if it's too wet, <clears throat> um, it can become anaerobic. And um, again, those, those food scraps won't be breaking down properly and they will start to smell. If that happens, um, you can always just add more of your brown inputs, more wood shavings or dried paper or leaves, something like that. And that'll help absorb some of that liquid. Okay. Um, now let's talk about animals. So um, we did have somebody asking about bears specifically, but there are all kinds of animals that would be interested in digging through your old food scraps and trying to find a meal. Um, that could be rodents uh, like raccoons and mice and squirrels. Um, it could be dogs, it could be bears, it could be deer. Um, it all depends on what's, what's in your area. But um, generally speaking, the same thing applies to keeping all animals out of your, out of your compost system. Um, one thing that is highly, well, the, the best thing you can do for keeping bears away is take down your bird feeders. Um, the bears wake up in the spring and they, there isn't really any food around and um, if you have your bird feeders out, they'll be able to smell them. They, they love sunflower seeds and they can smell them for miles. So that'll attract them in the first place. Um, the other thing you can do is make sure that you and your neighbors are keeping your food scraps out of your trash and inaccessible to bears. Um, because like I said, they wake up and, and they are hungry and they're looking for food and if um if they're able to find it in your area they're going to keep coming back and they're going to look everywhere they're going to look in your compost bin um, and they're going to try to get in um, for smaller animals um, use a quarter inch uh, hardware cloth to line the bin um, under and depending on your system on the sides as well that'll keep the small critters out um, if you use that in combination with for example boarding it up to keep bears out that will work too um, <clears throat> and i mentioned before that browns are very important in this browns like wood shavings they absorb a lot of the smells they also absorb the liquids which are what smells and they also make that the materials that you put in there break down a lot quicker than they would otherwise you can also use them just to cover everything up. And that really helps as well, because I mean, a bear might be still be interested in something that's all covered in wood shavings, but it might not. Um, the other thing that's important is to keep meat and bones out of your backyard bins, especially if you know that there's a bear in the area. Um, you can put those in your trash if it's secure, or you can bring it to a compost drop off site. Every transfer station in Vermont now has compost drop off or food scrap drop off sites. And, um, and that's a great way to, to keep your food scraps away from animals as well. Um, so I mentioned how bears are, they have really good noses. They can smell those, those bird feeders and that bird seed. Um, <clears throat> one thing that you can do to scare them off is use ammonia. Um, you can put a, a bucket with um, a cloth soaked in ammonia um, on or near your compost bin. I actually had a bear in my area and um, I have a, a two bin system that I built and um, the one is filled with my food scraps and my inputs. And then in the other one, <clears throat> I put a bucket with some ammonia and a rag in it and um, they didn't touch it after that. <clears throat> um, they are very sensitive and for them it's like smelling salts. They get a whiff of it and they go the other way. So I can attest that that's effective. Um, and then the other, the last tip that we have for keeping animals and bears away is using um, urine. So either coyote or um, some other kind of predator, including human, um, urine will, will scare most animals away. 
Um, you can also use hot pepper. I've even heard of some people putting their compost bins um, inside of electric fence enclosures and, um, and that sometimes keeps, can keep bears away. Uh, so, I mean, there are a lot of different options, but, but the most effective ones are to, you, to keep an enclosed system, keep your meat out, take your bird feeders down, and use a lot of browns. Um, that should keep bears away, and if they are still coming back, um, what you can do is you can always bring your food scraps to a drop-off site, um, and that should take, the, take your, your address off the list for the, for the bear's route. <clears throat> okay. Brenna and Dora, do you want to hop back on and we can take some more questions? Absolutely. We have some for sure. All right, great. <laughs> um, so I got a couple of questions about um, placing your green cones or soil savers. For green cones, can you place it in a raised vegetable garden, a raised bed for a vegetable garden? Hmm. Yeah, you could. That would be fine. Great. And then for soil savers, I have a couple of questions. Um, do they have to be placed on the open ground? Um, could this be better for organisms, to microorganisms for better access versus a tumbler or concrete pad? For the soil savers? Yes. Um, so the soil savers should have <clears throat> soil underneath them. Um, you, to get the organisms into the the bin, um, you want to have it on on soil, on dirt, so that they can <clears throat> um, come up through the bottom and access those those food scraps. Um, that reminds me that um, you know if you are using a tumbler system, you will need to inoculate that system with some microorganisms. Luckily, uh, as I mentioned, each teaspoon of soil has. 100 million to a billion microorganisms that can do that for you. So if you just put a little shovel or a little scoop full of dirt into your your tumbler, um, that will work wonders for you. Great. So I had another couple questions about the timelines for composting. How long does it take and how do you know when it's ready? Dora, do you want to take this one? Sure. So um, it should take about a year for everything to break down. But again, that could depend on, you know, like how much stuff you have inside and like what kind of things you have inside. Um, and sorry, what was the second part to that? How do you know when your compost is, is ready, is finished? Okay. Yeah, we get that question a lot. Um, you'll know simply when it looks like compost. So it'll be like brown and dark and um, you'll be able to see it and feel it. Great. Um, I have a few people who also want to know um, what to do in the winter if their compost freezes. So um, in the winter, your compost will freeze uh, just because it's the winter. But um, you can continue adding your food scraps and your browns. And during the um, spring, when the weather warms up, it'll just continue. It'll start up again. Um, so you can just keep, keep going as you are currently. Um, Darren, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, so, and I... I'm sure there are people from all over the place um, in different climates, but uh, for me, at my house, uh, everything just freezes solid in the winter. There's lots of snow. I, I can't even get out to the compost bin without snowshoes. So um, I have a large trash can <clears throat> that I put all my food scraps um, in all winter and they freeze solid and that's okay. Um, what I do is I, it has wheels on it, so I, I put in my food scraps and I put in browns at the same time. Again, that absorbs the smells and some of the liquids. Um, and then in the spring, I have a, a full 
or almost full trash can full of a mix of food scraps and wood shavings and I can roll it out all the way to the compost bin and dump it in. And that works for me. Um, the bears are asleep, so they won't bother it. Plus it's frozen solid. So, um, <clears throat> so that's my system and it works pretty well for me. Okay, great. Um, I also, in the winter, um, just take my food scraps to Vermont Compost Company instead of having to do it myself. Because yeah. I'm lazy, I don't want to shovel the snow off my composter. So um, that's always an option. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have some other folks who asked about how to keep flies down. So you want to add browns. So if you're having um, just keep in mind the ratio of three to one, so three parts browns, one parts greens. Um, if you're noticing that there are a lot of flies, um, just uh, add a little more browns and that should help. All right, um, that looks like we answered pretty much all of the questions. Oh, um, I had someone just came in with, I have, <laughs> I have spiders, geckos, and others in their compost bin. Is this an issue? <laughs> it, it's not an issue. <clears throat> um, well, I've, I've never had geckos in my compost bin. I, I've never lived in that kind of climate, but um, but if you get some of that quarter inch hardware cloth, that'll keep the, the geckos out too. The geckos are probably there to eat the bugs. Oh, and I, I just want to add um, separate from that point that uh, we will be sharing this webinar recording with everyone afterwards. So if you want to review it, uh, we will be sending that after. All right. Well, if anybody has any other questions, please type them in now and we'll answer them. Otherwise, thank you everybody for coming. And um, <clears throat> if you have any other questions, you can check out our website. We've got a great page on composting. We also have plans for compost bins if you want to build your own. And uh, yeah, thanks again for coming. We do have a couple more questions. They're really rolling in. <laughs> well, let's take a couple more. Yeah, yeah. Um, for um, some people want to know how to reduce smells in their house. Um, do they need a special bin with charcoal or are there any other strategies? Yeah, so um, one of the best things you can do is, um, is add wood shavings right away. Even um, if you want to, you can add a little, a little bit of wood shavings into your countertop collection pail. Um, I know our, our coworker John does that and he swears by it. Um, the other thing you, you want to do is just make sure you take it out frequently and when you get it back, um, rinse it out, wash it out with a dirty old brush and, um, and uh, that should keep the smells down. Um, <clears throat> I did I did remember uh, somebody asking about a place to find wood shavings and I did want to, I wanted to come back to that and give a couple of recommendations. Um, <clears throat> so one way you can get wood shavings is you can buy them in a big bale, like a, I think it's a, a two foot by three foot bale. Um, and they sell them at uh, pet supply stores as animal bedding or you can get them at a, a yard and garden store or a hardware store. Um, and it's about $5, $6 for one of those. <clears throat> so if you get one of those, it'll last you a long time. Um, that's a great option for, for home composting. Um, alternatively, if you <clears throat> uh, do a little bit of research in your area, find a local mill shop or wood shop or a lumber yard, and they often have lots and lots and lots of wood shavings that they're just 
trying to get rid of. So um, if you can find one of those places, give them a call. Um, I just went down to the, the mill shop the other day and got a, a massive bag of wood shavings that I'm going to use in my compost. Um, so that's another great option. And um, I also wanted to add one more tip about um, how to keep odors down. So um, especially right now with, with the weather warming, um, one other thing you could do is uh, if you're dropping off, say you're dropping off your compost once a week, um, you can keep your compost in like a bucket or some sort of a container in your freezer. Um, that's what my sister does. She lives in New York City in a small apartment and she just keeps everything in a freezer until she can bring it to a drop off. Yeah, that's a great way to do it too. Great, so um, that's about all that we have for questions. Okay, well, thanks everybody. Thanks Brenna and Dora. Um, we'll see you next time. Thanks everyone.